Yo, brother. What's going on, bro? How are you? What's going on, man? Finally get, getting this going. Yeah, man. It's been uh, a long time, you know, in, in the plans. So For sure. happy, happy to be on and uh, hope everything's well with the with the knee injury and, and everything. How's that going? Yeah, it was the groin. I got... Uh, I got oh, sorry, um, the groin. Yeah. No worries. No worries. I got uh, sports hernia surgery, but um, bro, like... I don't know, man. Like I, I, I've been telling like a couple friends and people like, you know, I, I always was used to being like the fittest guy on the field every single time and, yeah. you know, up and down the pitch. But like coming back from an injury, I never, you know, I only had like one major injury, like a high ankle sprain, but I was only out for three months. Yeah. Um, but with this man, I was out for like seven, eight months. Yeah. And just, bro, getting back to full fitness is uh, not easy, you know, especially journey. match fitness. Yeah, yeah. 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 But it's, Definitely. you know, it's part of the mental, the mental process. Like I, I've used it as a process to become mentally tougher. Like the rehab 100%. exercises, all that bullshit is not easy. But as with everything, if you, there's two perspectives, there's either, either the perspective of, oh, you know, I'm not as fit as I used to be and you dwell, or you say, you know, I'm not as fit as I used to be. I'm going to get, you know, fitter than I used to be. It's going to take time, but I'm going to use it to strengthen my mind. Yeah, I mean, uh, I've never gone through something so serious myself, but uh, I imagine you just kind of have to start from zero and just be like, look, I have to forget who I was before and exactly. build, build from scratch, you know, because if, exactly. if you kind of look in comparison to what your fitness was before, you'll just get pissed off, you know? 100%. Yeah, yeah but, uh, you know, I appreciate you asking with this podcast about you. I appreciate you coming on, taking the time. I know you're a busy guy. Um, yeah. you know, we, we've, we've talked before. I know we have similar mindsets, ways of looking at training and at life and bettering yourself. So, um, yeah, if you could just introduce yourself, you know, who you are and, uh, where you're from, uh, how you got into the game, kind of, um, what kind of led you up to where you are now, and then we'll kind of go in, in depth. Yeah. Yeah. So my name's Sergio Anton. I'm a one-to-one trainer as well as a, a player myself i've uh, returned to playing for some of some people close to me they know that uh but yeah i mean uh, back back pursuing that you know professional contract awesome. uh, i was born in uh romania in uh Bufta, small kind of town outside of the capital city i uh, moved to canada when i was uh three years old and uh, grew up in um brampton which is around Toronto uh, until I was 16, kind of typical um, youth soccer set up there uh, with the local club in Brampton. Uh, and then at 14, I, I uh, got selected to be a part of uh, the Toronto FC Academy, spent two years there. Then uh, I got released at 16. Um, <clears throat> from there, I went to Portugal and uh, basically trained for two years one year was with Braga one year was with Benfica's juniors uh, but I also got a lot of like tournaments in and a lot of friendlies in um, following season right, let's of, just dive into those two you said yeah. two things that I want to dive into um, so the first thing um, when you got released from the TFC Academy was that kind of the first setback that you've had uh, with your career? No, I mean, growing up, I, I'd always been, so from eight years old until 12 years old, I would, there was always A, B, C. Sometimes there was D teams in other clubs, whatever. My club had A and B, basically, um, but quite competitive. Um, and we were, I was always on the B team until I was 12. Um, mm -hmm. Then when I was I mean, every season I was a very competitive kid and uh, always wanted to be selected for the A team, play on those top teams. But mm -hmm. unfortunately, I guess my physicality lacked a lot. And that's a big part of the game in, in North America, especially in those youth ages, which is something mm -hmm, that mm -hmm. I'll get into later. That kind of inspired me to start my training business because I'm a big, big believer in technicality and, mm -hmm. and cognitive training. And I was trying to kind of change the culture in Canada uh, surrounding youth development. Um, mm -hmm. 
But yeah, those were my first setbacks. Just like constantly year in, year out, not making mm-hmm. the A team, not making the A team. Finally made the A team. One year, I just had an explosion. Um, made the what A-team. position were you playing? I was playing as a winger, uh, as a striker, uh, first years. Then I started to transition into winger slash attacking mid, and uh-huh. uh, that that really suits suits me now. You know, as mm. as a as an adult, yeah. Okay, so 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 you ended up. Uh, you said you were with TFC for two years before they released you. Yeah, that's right. So I got selected there. I went to a trial. There was. So I was 14 years old, I think, 13, 14. There was about two, 300 kids out at, at this trial. It was, it was mm. just like an open trial. And wow. uh, they were going to pick players. I mean, they already had players identified from uh, scouting the leagues and stuff like that. I wasn't in those uh, scouting reports. So I just went into the open trial. Two, 300 kids. Kids were getting wow. like released by the dozens every day like 30 40 every single day uh Mm -hmm. so it was like a two month process three month process of of trials finally got into the team and actually into the the starting 11 for the whole year so from 300 i i managed to break my way into 11 um which was selected from across the province so it was Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. a really really i got really high on that but uh, in hindsight, I think I got too high on it. You know, you lose mm. kind of that that edge when you get a bit of yeah, and you're in a professional uh, setting, and and it's your first taste of that that sort of training every day. Get your kit laid out for you. You leave your boots exactly. at the training ground, all that stuff, okay. and all the yeah. hype that comes along along with it. You lose yeah. your head a little bit, and uh, yeah. definitely that's what that's what happened to me. Led to my release, uh, one one way or another. Maybe mm-hmm. it was some political things, some not. But definitely, I'm a big believer in if you work your ass off and 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 you continue to work on your game, those things don't matter, you know. So, For sure. Yeah. So like when you so you said you spent uh, you know most of your time on, on the B team until you got signed to the A team. Did you like when you? Um, I'm sure you had the desire, obviously, to make the A-team and that ambition. Um, Were you doing any extra stuff outside of team training? What were you doing um, that – did you notice anything that helped you make that jump? Yeah, so massive uh, amount of of technical work that I did outside of my team training with this guy Mm -hmm. named Woody Bailey. So Mm -hmm. this guy Woody was basically – the the first guy in in kind of Toronto area to do like technique training, um, Jamaican guy, very old school like, but he did a lot of Corver style training, mm. so um, very heavily influenced by Corver one one on one training and um, working like one on one skills should I say not one to one but one on one skills two on two kind of like small sided games tons of technical work. So I did a lot of that from 12 to 14, and that led to basically my explosion. I just bursted walls, and it started mm, to show in my awesome. game. Yeah, and uh, actually... How often were you doing it? Man, I was... I mean, I was with him two, two, three times a week outside of my team sessions, but I was doing extras on my own every day. Like, I, I just became at those ages obsessed with the ball. Yep. So if you yep. look if you look at if you look at like my my ability on the ball, it's definitely one of my strengths. And mm-hmm, and, and mm-hmm. that that's something that even if I don't touch a ball for five months, which I have done before when I when I took a brief period off football, like it, it comes right back to you if you've it's spent awesome. the time kind of ingraining yes. it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. No, that's awesome, man. So so after you, you had that setback uh, with Toronto and they let you go, what was kind of your, um, your reaction uh, from an emotional standpoint, from a physical standpoint? How did you look at it? I mean, I, I remember uh, I got the we – we, they brought in a bunch of players and we were all fighting for positions. I 
basically started every single game except for one match the whole season, did really well at MLS Cup, all this stuff. So I was thinking, look, my 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 position's quite secure in this team, you know, mm-hmm. for the following season. Mm-hmm. And we had a trip actually uh, planned to go to to Holland, and we were going to play against Ajax, against uh, top top uh, academies in Europe. So mm-hmm. I was really looking forward to it. Called me into the office. They said, "Look, Serge, we're we're releasing you. Not you're not a part of the team next year." Gave me mm-hmm. the typical, you know. Stay, stick around the area. Mm-hmm. We'll have a look at you. Yeah. Blah blah blah. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then, I mean, I took that really poorly. I I think I bursted out into tears from the minute I left the office, took mm-hmm. a shower, went home. I was bawling mm-hmm. for about an hour, two hours, three hours. Mm-hmm. My grandmother was uh, home, and I thought she thought somebody died or something. Jesus. So I took it. Yeah, I took it really yeah. poorly. I mean, in hindsight. Um, but it shows your probably, passion for the game, you know. I was a very passionate kid. Anybody that that's probably watching this uh, right now or listening, uh, they know that I put. I, I used to wear my heart on my sleeve. I've changed a lot uh, as I've matured, but I mean, as a kid, I was the kid that was getting yellow cards all the time because yeah. uh, yeah. I was, you know, if I lost the ball, I'd be fucking chasing it down, pulling yeah. people's shirts, you know, just yeah, yeah. Kind of a bit, a bit hot headed, yeah. Yeah, but that's what it's all about, man. I mean, I last week I actually we had we've have a younger guy training with us. I think he's like 16, 17 just to get some first team experience. And we had like some scrimmages the other day and he was on my team and he's good technically and and good on the ball, but dude, he was just like shying away from challenges, man. And like literally I I told I told him what you said, like dude, like as a player, man, whenever you go out, you got to leave your balls on the pitch, you know, yeah. like Spanish coaches would always tell tell me leave the, your cojones on the cojones, pitch. Man. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I swear, man. I bro, like, and I told him, and like, he, he switched. But that's what it's all about, man. Like, you gotta show your passion. Show, obviously, always. to a certain extent, control yeah. it. But yeah. when people see that passion and energy from you, uh, you know, they really they feed off it. They feed off the energy, and they appreciate the work. You know. Hundred percent. Yeah, it's super important to be intense in what you're doing, and people take it the wrong way. Uh, I, I've seen a, a culture come out recently with with uh, with kids where it's like almost not cool to work hard, and I yeah. think that's the biggest bullshit. You know, like since sorry, it just uh, yeah something popped. Up. No worries. Up. Yeah. Since when? Um, you know, since when is it not cool to succeed by? Uh, sacrificing and working hard every single day that's you know that's that's obvious you know but people want this kind of effortless yeah Yeah. i'm good when i don't try hard like it doesn't work that way man and yeah uh, yeah. just you know so yeah working hard is everything and um yeah I'm, i'm happy to say that i've i've recently kind of dug into what I've given this some thought. I was like, what made me so good or mm. as a, a, what made me good and passionate as a 12 year old? And it's, mm. it's that it's, it's the passion. It's uh work ethic. I remember uh, one session when I was 14, right before I went off to Toronto FC, my club coach, he was saying, he gave me as an example to the other players. And he said, you know why uh, Serge will always be picked for, for a team? Because he's the hardest working player in the session. Whenever he, mm. he he trains, whenever he plays, he's the hardest worker. Um, and so, you know, I had to kind of remember, look, what brought you success initially? What what made you stand out? And it was it was work ethic. So, you know, you have to revisit that mm. kind of change change your mentality and go back at it i mean i know rick for you that's that's not a problem you're you're a real hard worker but mm-hmm. i think for a lot of players you tend to rely on your abilities and uh you know uh the ball needs to come in the right place and whatever and it's like no man you got to just yeah be be put it all in there and it's going to actually maximize your abilities whatever you're good at it's gonna make it even better and whatever Mm -hmm. you're bad at it's gonna kind of or not so good at it's gonna kind of hide it you know it's gonna compensate for it Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. absolutely man absolutely 100 percent agree 
we'll, we'll talk about that further after, but I, I want to definitely get into what kind of ages, you know, uh, and, and where, where uh, you've kind of seen that people kind of judge hard work in that way. It's interesting. Yeah. Uh, but I want to get into, keep getting into your journey. So after, um, how, how'd you make that move to Portugal? Did you have connections? How did you organize that move? So basically my club coach that I was with uh, before I went to Toronto FC, he had this, <clears throat> this link with uh, an agent, this Brazilian guy that, that would take players abroad. He would take them to Brazil. Uh, he would take them to Portugal a lot. He had some connections uh, across Europe. Mm -hmm. So he basically got in contact with him and said, look, you know, I have – I have a 14-year-old, uh, or sorry, at the time, 16-year-old kid. He's just been released. He's serious about his football, mm. and uh, he wants an opportunity. Um, at the time, there was only three professional clubs in all of Canada. So uh, Toronto FC, Montreal Impact, and, and Vancouver Whitecaps. So the closest thing to me was, was probably Montreal Impact, which was mm -hmm. still like a eight. 10 hour drive from where yeah. I was so mm -hmm. I said look I I really wanted to experience Europe I'd, I'd been uh, on a tournament in Spain and obviously every little kid's dream is to go there so I went um, yeah I didn't you know my parents weren't informed I wasn't informed that when we showed up there you wouldn't actually be allowed to play uh, as a as a foreigner in Europe mm -hmm. until you're 18 in the academy mm -hmm, system mm -hmm. unless you're side on, signed on a, on a professional contract. So I was kind of stuck. You know, I, I, I really wanted to stay, stick it out, train. So that's what I did. Mm -hmm. I trained, trained with Braga, who was living with uh, three other Canadian boys, and we were training every single day. And, uh, yeah, then I got the opportunity to basically go on trial at uh, Benfica. They said, look, you're, you're a good player. You have talent. Uh, you can come in and, and train with us for the year. Um, you've got to pay for your accommodations and stuff, but uh, you, can, you can train. So I said, fantastic, mm -hmm. I'm playing. Yeah, so from there... Um, actually, How old were you then? Seventeen. Seventeen, yeah, seventeen. So, in that first journey at Praga, I was training with the likes of uh, this guy uh, Pedro Pedro Gonçalves. He's playing for Sporting right now. And yeah. um, the second, you know, in Benfica, um, first training session, Renato Sanchez was in the training session. Wow. Ruben Diaz. Um, bunch of other wow. players that are playing in the first division in Portugal, Diogo Gonçalves, Alfa Semedo in the championship, like tons and tons of players. What did you notice about these guys? Any Anything you kind of picked up uh, on, on the difference of them compared to other guys, how they approach training, how they, um, you know, how they prepared for training, how they cooled down, and any kind of difference that you notice about these guys? If I'm honest with you, man, professionalism in uh, in North America is much better than in Portugal. So in oh, Portugal, yeah, in Portugal there is that culture of like. I mean, I showed up to Benfica and nobody was really doing extras. People were kind of walking through the warm-ups uh -huh, uh -huh. you know not really kind of you, you know you know what i'm talking about that yeah, yeah, yeah. superstar mentality and stuff like yeah, that yeah, yeah, yeah. so that was definitely present but in terms of talent man these guys were years years ahead of what i'd mm -hmm. seen um i mean they had the talent at 17 that most players develop when they're in their early 20s, you know, 21, 22. So you, that, that goes to show you how much football they had in their feet, how much yeah. uh, coaching education uh, goes into that academy, top class academy. I have nothing but the, uh, nothing but respect for every mm -hmm. single coach in there. Really professional in terms of methodology. Mm -hmm. They understand football like ins and outs yeah. and everything. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean that first. So, did you notice was, a difference in in, in game intelligence? Uh, game intelligence. I mainly. think that's what I what I noticed the major yeah. difference between Americans and 
and Europeans, man. Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, game mentality was just different level, and um, I could I could keep up, right? It was never a problem of me like sticking out like a sore thumb or something. I actually did all right, but you, you it's not good enough to you know stick in there. You want to earn your spot. You have to be better than the the people in the in the squad. Sure. You have to be competing, uh, not just competing, but giving the starters a real run for the money. Uh, if you want to have any chance at signing in these sorts of clubs, so you know it was a, a real wake up call in terms of levels and and things like that. But it gave me some confidence because I I com- I was comparing myself against some of the world's top players i guess i mean you think about where these guys are now uh renato sanchez won the french league uh, uh two two three day, days ago yeah. Uh, yeah you know so future champions ruben diaz just won premier league is going to play champions league final on uh on uh saturday so mm-hmm. yeah i had an amazing amazing period of time where i developed my game a lot what lacked during that period of time was games um, matches week in week out you know so I needed mm-hmm. game time which led me to leads me I guess to that the end of that season mm-hmm. I uh, had a cap for um, two caps for a Romanian national team uh, which was which was decent um, kind of tricky with the with the coach there basically played me about five minutes uh, in each match. Didn't really give me a chance to show show myself uh, Mm -hmm. one training session. I mean, five minutes in each match. So that didn't really go my way. Uh, Then it was uh, off to Belgium for a trial in the second division with my cousin. He'd signed signed in the second division and uh, I, I trialed there. I was actually trialing as a striker, but mm. it was not suited for me at all. Didn't play well. Didn't sh- really. I mean, I played all right, but didn't really show myself the way I wanted to, uh, and didn't justify, I guess, my my demands from uh, from the trial. Um, so then that led me to um, Nacional de Madeira. So I had an agent that I knew uh, in Portugal, and he hooked me up with a trial at, at Nacional de Madeira, the juniors. And uh, I went in there a week, boom, signed for the season. And it was, uh, it was a good opportunity for me because it was the same division that Benfica was in. Um, mm. Was this still and, youth or was this... Uh, still youth, still youth. Still youth. How but, old were you? Uh, 18, yeah. Okay. Yeah, but under 19 season, so mm-hmm. 18, 19, yeah. Mm-hmm. So from there, yeah, um, I was playing game in, game out for about a season. Uh, had a had a decent season, um, but definitely, definitely, that's when kind of the the bullshit started to enter my mind. You know, mm. the bullshit started to enter my mind. So right when, I guess right when you should be gearing yourself towards the the men's game the following season and really buckling down working on your game developing your mindset my mindset was all off uh missing home distracted uh if things didn't go my way wouldn't try to figure it out how can i Mm -hmm. make it better just terrible mindset and then at the end of the season, I had a couple couple options to go third division, you know, third division mm-hmm, in Portugal, mm-hmm. which in hindsight, it's not it's not a bad option. Uh, yeah. It's actually quite a good option at 19 years old uh, to go and, and, and play in For the sure. men's divisions, uh, mm-hmm. third division especially. But uh, again, like I said, I had a lot of bullshit in my head. And uh, when I heard, okay, you probably won't be getting paid too much this season they, they'll probably pay for your accommodation and your food but you're not going to have any money I said you know oh my ego was too big I said no no chance whatever and I basically chose um, I chose to go to university in mm. in, uh, in Toronto 
So that led me to to uh, York University, where where I uh, played for for two years there. You were nineteen when you started. Yeah, nineteen. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. So I'd basically been one year, I guess, behind most of the other university students. Um, mm -hmm. Like everyone my age, ninety seven was uh, in their second year. I was in my first year. So mm -hmm. yeah. Anyways, went in there. It's never going to be the same thing. You have a three-month season. It's, I mean, you're playing with players that uh, maybe they have ambitions to play pro, maybe they don't. Just not really what you want to be in. And slowly, slowly started to lose my passion for the game after so mm. many rejections, so many setbacks, so many years of um, not playing proper matches and when I do play proper matches maybe my development's not up to par and so I just I my mentality let me down and I stopped playing for about six months there after mm. after the second year I think so and, you were 21 uh, when you stopped yeah 21 yeah mm -hmm. right I now. think one of the hardest things man is um is like you know um for a lot like when you you know i've seen it with a lot of my friends who were younger they played at top level top academies um and then they went into the pro game and they saw the reality they saw the reality that they're not going to get paid big money right away it's not how it looks on tv and instagram and youtube uh you're gonna have to sacrifice you're gonna have to live in a shit apartment with you know five six guys yeah. share food uh, you're going to get paid dirt money. Facilities yeah. aren't going to be great. Yeah. But I don't think people see the light at the end of the tunnel, you know? People um, don't know. Yeah, that's exactly it. And, uh, and I think I think that's what, what uh, you know, older guys like, like us, like Matt Sheldon, 7MLC, uh, those guys need to try to impact the game in that positive way that, I mean, you know uh, – I love uh, Matt's podcast against all odds. You see all these guys, they had it tough, but when they kept pushing, things worked out. And, and, and I think uh, a lot of players don't make it pro. They don't make it to the next level because it's very hard to persist, you know? Uh, and I'm yeah. sure your attitude has changed now. We'll talk about later, but, um, you know, going from playing at, at these top clubs, you know, uh, Benfica, uh, Madeira, and then coming back and and playing uh, college ball, you said, uh, you know, I don't know if it's worth it. So, um, like you said, you maybe you know well, what I was going to ask you. Did you have anyone to talk to, any mentor to kind of uh, talk about your thoughts with, or or were you just kind of you know in your own head? Yeah, uh, I had some some role models that again. I'm not going to, you know, call names and stuff, but yeah. they weren't the best role models. I was kind of looking up to them in terms of I really admired their skill set with the ball on the field. Yeah. But mentality-wise, the worst mentality ever. So if I'll give you a kind of an insight as to what that mentality looks like. It was like, yeah, you know, it doesn't matter. Go smoke shisha. You can train the next day go uh you can go out on the weekend that's no worries you can drink whatever you want that's no problem you're you're talented bro look what you can do with the ball come on you, yeah. you, you. so that sort of mentality and uh of course it was it was poor and at that point i had already um through comparison with other people like i was comparing myself with kind of uh, the academy players that I'd seen in Portugal that I'd played with that were my teammates and they were making strides through the game, starting to play at the top top level, some of them Champions League and stuff. And I looked at myself and I said, man, I'm I'm in a, a university mm -hmm. paying, paying for my tuition because mm. in Canada they don't do the whole scholarship thing. Uh, you know, just not happy with it at all. And I guess I didn't really uh, see the light at the end of the tunnel. I wasn't willing to eat the, the shit, like you said, exactly. with, with, you know, living with other people in an apartment. Uh, facilities aren't the best. 
it's it's an entitled mentality you know yep, that's, yep. that's the root of it is the academy system tends to breed um entitled footballers uh that the ability maybe doesn't doesn't back the ambition right so mm -hmm. your ability has to match your ambition and your actions have to line up with your goal so mm -hmm. that's just two things that weren't in line and i know it's a common thing uh, you've seen it definitely yourself Mm -hmm. But uh, actually, you know, speaking of Matt Sheldon and, and uh, Michael Cunningham and stuff, like, you know, having watched those guys and, and, and listened to their stories, it did l maybe reframe things for me. And it made it obvious, like, look, um, these guys are willing to play for free sometimes, work mm -hmm. from the bottom, build their way up. If you love the game, you'll do it, and you'll be you'll be compensated down the line. You know, you'll you'll get your shot eventually. You just gotta keep your head down and, and continue working. Mm hmm. I understand. One hundred percent, man. Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, yeah. You know, Matt, Matt, and and Michael are, are you know. Everyone sees how physically strong they are and technically good, but from the mindset standpoint, those two guys are top. So. That's everything, two, two man. Two role models. Yeah, hundred um, percent. But yeah, so after, uh, so when you made that decision to stop playing for six months, what was your next step? So basically, the the one on one, the technique coach that I that I told you about, Woody Bailey, the one that that helped me a lot when I was twelve, thirteen. I went and worked for him uh, for about mm -hmm. six months. Then, uh, actually, sorry, I more more like a year and a half, two years, I was working from, for him. So from like 20, I was still playing. 20 till about 22, I was working for him every Friday, doing camps with him and, and all that stuff. Um, living at home, still kind of playing, but not so serious. Went mm -hmm. through a period of time where I didn't touch a ball for six months. Didn't want to mm -hmm. see it. I like mm -hmm. almost hated the game. And then... Um, yeah, after two years of, of, of coaching with under Woody Bailey, I really started to understand, like, I have I have a, a knack with kids, you know. I have an ability to uh, to teach kids, and they seem to seem to respond to my, my delivery, my approach to them. And, um, yeah, so I started to do one-on-one -on -one training, Mm -hmm. in Kitchener Waterloo which was about one hour away from Mississauga uh from where Woody Bailey was so it was a different market you know I wasn't competing with my mentor it was a different market kind of untapped and uh yeah that led to the start of uh Roca technical soccer training now mm -hmm. Roca technical football training I've changed it since we're in the UK but yeah uh that led to that and uh slowly started to to grow the the business there um one kid led to two two kids led to four to eight and next thing you know it i i had over 150 kids probably throughout my programs and i was going and doing team sessions uh mind you it didn't happen like that but, yeah of course uh maybe a year and a half later it really skyrocketed um and uh, brought me a ton of coaching opportunities, was was making good money, really happy lifestyle-wise, traveling the world. I visited, mm -hmm. like, I don't know how many countries in 2019, just tons of traveling. Mm -hmm. um, and then, How are you? How are you? You just said it, but I want to touch it. How were you mentally and from a happiness standpoint at that I, point in 2019? I was, I was happy because I had my own I, I felt like I'd kind of grown as an adult I was on my own two feet uh fending for myself I was able to you know afford everything that I wanted and and more and you know making my way to like probably buying a house in a few years just really doing well um and then corona hit and uh it was a period of time where I sat back and I started my podcast, whatever. I was still pursuing my business, but obviously you're not as busy as you are previously. 
So you have mm-hmm. more time to yourself to reflect. Started to reflect, and I, I every single year, right around July, uh, since I stopped playing seriously, I, I always have like a, I always had a fire inside me to, to go back and play, um, while I was coaching, but mm. I, I guess I didn't want to sacrifice, uh, my, my, my financial, uh, uh, you know, my financial mm-hmm. situation for that pursuit because it does require quite a bit of time and sacrifice. Um, so it was always in my belly every year. And whenever I would go play with recreational leagues, it was eating away at me. And uh, so man, me and my girlfriend, uh, one day I came back and I said, what, what would you think if we just moved? <laughs> what, would you, what would you say if we just moved to to Europe? That's big, bro. That's big. And uh, she how was, long were you with uh, your girl at this point? What's that? How long were you with your girl at this point? Yeah, so like three years, three and a half uh-huh. years. So quite serious. Uh, we're yeah. about to celebrate our fourth year together. So yeah, I mean bro. we're we're like two two peas in a pod, just very very close. Mm-hmm. So I I said to her, look, why don't we do that? She'd been nagging me for a long time to move to Europe because it's uh, yeah. it's been her dream as well. She loves Europe. Uh, it's awesome. Born in Romania as well, just like me, raised in Canada, but just very like European mindset, European um, lifestyle, you know. So, yeah, we 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 made the decision to move, and uh, we moved in October, and then uh, I started to to go back back to training again, and I shifted my mindset. I said, look, I'll 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 build this one to one coaching here, but I'm gonna I'm gonna also play and obviously I'm gonna have to start from, from the bottom in non league. Uh no problem. It's fine, you know, because I'll be able to basically play part time and mm. build my business. But really my first priority is is playing. So I'm getting my training sessions in every single morning, uh training my ass off mentality is the best it's ever been it's feeling, unreal. feeling sharper than i've ever uh been you know on the ball fitness wise everything so yeah it's positive and uh, uh i mean from from the coaching standpoint it's it's going quite good um but again i really just want to fulfill that that burning sensation inside of me mm, and that's awesome. uh, i think it's a shame for anybody that has has had that passion as a kid and pursued it to to a professional level for many years to not see what your potential your full potential looks like you know mm. what does that look like when yeah you're 29 you're at the peak of your your performance uh you you know you've got years of experience under under your uh your belt what does that look like? You know, mm-hmm. what is your best season look like? So yeah. I just, uh, I wanted to go back at it, going at, back at it now. And uh, I'm happy, man. I'm very happy. I mean, awesome. making less money, definitely. Uh, struggling more, definitely. But for some mm-hmm. reason, I'm, I'm even happier than I was uh, awesome. uh, two, two years ago when, when I was, you know, living lavish and whatever. I'm even happier now. It's fucking great, bro. It's great story, yeah. man. And that's why I want to bring you on. And, uh, bro, Gary Vee always says, stay the course, man. And and that's what I think it's all about. You know, like, there's so many ups and downs and more downs than there are ups, man. Yeah. But if you stay the course, uh, <laughs> if you stay the course, Grandma Rosa, that kid's a clown. If you stay the course, uh, things will work out. And I think that the, the biggest thing he always says is no regrets, man. So let's take, let's, uh, you know, I remember we had a talk and you were telling me how, how, uh, how unreal the training business was doing. And then when you made, when you told me you were going to make the jump out to London and uh, pursue the game again while, while training, I said, that's unreal, man. I said, really good for you. I mean, uh, you know, big ups because that's very hard. Um, you know, may, may, the journey as a player is hard enough, but a one-to-one coach and a player is even harder, especially in, in, in London. 
Yeah. So, um, so how's that been? How have, um, how's the transition been, uh, as a coach, as a footballer, um, maybe take us through, how about you take us through a day in your life? Uh, kind of like, I always love giving this perspective for younger guys. What does your day look like? What time you wake up? What, what are your habits? What are your routines? Because me and yeah. you both, we always talk about the, the importance of healthy habits, healthy routines. Uh, and I think, um, you running through your day will help a lot of young guys so and girls. Yeah, man. I mean, um, I guess a typical day in my life, I wake up around 6, uh, probably grab my – I prepare my breakfast the night before, uh, chia seeds, pumpkin seeds, uh, no sugar, almond milk, whatever. I make like a little pudding, eat that, uh, coffee, vitamins – Head to the pitch six forty five seven, and uh, from seven thirty till about mm, let's say nine thirty ten. So two to two and a half hours. It's either a training session with this group of guys in East London that are all kind of in the same boat as me, like early twenties, or some of them are actually like thirty. Um, mm-hmm. One guy is actually thirty four. He's played Europa League. Uh, qualified for Champions League last year and stuff. So, like, amazing. Wow. Yeah, man, there's some crazy players out here. And uh, But goes to show you, he's without a club right now, you know? Uh, he's without a club. So, it's it's a tough journey. Even after his experience and his ability, it's a tough journey. But, yeah, I go and, and I uh, p- train with those guys. We basically play. We scrimmage for about two hours, but it's not – you know, it's not a kick about, it's not i uh, I'm, I'm showing up to burn some calories. It's everyone's mm-hmm. there to work on their game and, and, uh, and uh, compete and create a, a really good environment. So it's, it's healthy. And then on, on the days that I don't do that, I, uh, I go to a local field by here and I, I work on, uh, on my game with, with uh, a few of, of the guys that I've met around here that are kind of like-minded, working hard. And uh, then from there, I'll come home, uh, eat lunch, prepare my sessions for the day. What do you What do you usually have for lunch? Uh, my girlfriend. I'm very lucky, man. I, I, <laughs> I live with with uh, with the top chef. Jeez, yeah, lucky yeah. man, bro. Yeah, bro. So she always, you know, hooks me up with like amazing food. I'm actually rushing home from from training to, to come eat it. <laughs> That's plus. No, I, um. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I've recently switched to a vegetarian diet. It's uh, it's interesting. I mean, I'm not super like strict about it. I, I still eat meat if if I really want to. I'll, mm. I'll eat something nice, like a nice uh, lamb or a nice duck or something like nicely cooked. But my mm. main concern with it was. Um, all the hormones and and uh, yeah. the bullshit that's put inside of meat nowadays, you're really not eating the best quality. Uh, so that was my main concern with it. But yeah, I mean lentils, beans, uh, sweet potatoes, tons of veggies, roasted veggies, soups, uh, that sort of thing, mm-hmm. yogurt. Um, yeah, that's what I eat basically. Then I head out to the pitch. Unfortunately. Traffic here in, in London is insane. So I'll usually leave, if I have a 5 p.m. session, I'll leave uh, about uh, 2.30, get there at 3.30, and then mm. I'll, I'll do my own individual technique work for about an hour, uh, set up the training session for the, for the evening, and then uh, I run through my, my one-on-ones uh, from there, or two-on-ones, whatever it is. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Come back. So how, how many clients usually have a day? Uh, about two, three. Yeah, two, three a day. Mm-hmm. Not every single day, but uh, it's getting there. The problem with London, and I'll get to the adaptation part, is uh, it's such a big place, and uh, yeah. it's not big landmass wise, but it takes a long time from get to get from point to point. So if you live mm-hmm. in south or if you live in east. Or if you live in West, you're kind of isolated to whatever neighborhood you live in. Yeah. Because it's so hard to get around. 
but uh -huh. yeah, I make my sacrifices. Some days I'm south, some days I'm east, some days I'm very central around me. So mm. I just kind of work with with the clients uh, that I have and and uh, go from there. Uh, and then yeah, I mean uh, stretching, foam rolling at night, cold showers uh, to aid recovery because I'm I'm very very active. So uh, if I don't do that, I'll really feel it the next day, and I won't be able to train at full capacity. Mm -hmm. And then yeah, go to sleep around eleven and uh, start again. Love it, man. That's like it's a grind, bro. It's a grind. Love it's a grind, it. Grind, bro. Try to mix in the the video editing, the podcast, all that <laughs> in between. But uh, only so many hours in the day. I, I mean, I have no idea how you do it, bro. Like you're an yeah. absolute machine, man. You got to start yeah. a course on uh, <laughs> time management and, and yeah. uh, video editing because you crunch out like one, two vi videos a day on Instagram, keep up with the stories, YouTube, podcast, uh, yeah. blogs, uh, fuck it, everything, man. You're all over the place. Facts, facts. Nah, I mean, bro, like, you know. When I was when I was over in Israel and I had a girlfriend, it was a different story. You know, you know yeah. how it is. You got to spend time with your girl. You got to spend yeah. time with your significant other, and and you need to. That that's part of it. You need to spend time with good friends. So of for me, like for me, like I'm looking at this year as like a grind mode. Uh, I'm trying to do some something big. Uh, I got something big in the works in the next couple of months. Uh, really focusing on my football. I made a sacrifice coming over here, but just like we talked about, that's what it's about. Like. You know, I had to break up with my girl who I was with like for about a year, year, uh, really close. But you got to do it, man. Um, yeah. And uh, I think it makes you stronger, you know. And, and we were talking by WhatsApp a little bit how uh, there's ups and downs. But you got to always try to find that uh, that bright light, you know, because it's always there, you know. Um, I always listen to Goggins. Every time I listen to Goggins, I yeah. pick up something new, man. Yeah. Um, and uh, he was just saying something like, and I love this man. He said he he said that uh, God gave him his road as a training ground for life, mm. and um, that's how I look at my journeys. Every journey has been a training ground for the next phase. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. Um, and I'm sure you feel that way. So. I think does Instagram is it still like one hour you're allowed? Yeah, one hour. So I okay, think we so we like got nine, nine minutes. Nine minutes. Yes. Yeah. So if we could just crunch out some things, you know, how, how yeah. the adaptation has been, uh, how you've enjoyed London, and then I want to get into like at the last five minutes, I want to ask you some specific questions. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I mean, same thing like you're saying uh, about adaptation to 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 your life and and building that mental resilience. I think it's super important, man, and it's 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 more important than. Sorry, I, I you couldn't cut off there. Yeah, yeah, what were you saying? Yeah, yeah. Sorry about that. Um, no worries. Yeah, I think more important than anything, it's putting yourself in uncomfortable situations on a daily basis and yes. uh, I know you talk about it. I know, I mean, I'm a big, big fan of, uh, of David Goggins, Gary V as well for, from a productivity standpoint, but David Goggins from a mentality standpoint. And uh, recently Tim Grover. Uh, oh, love him. I've been yeah. listening to him too, man. Unreal. Wow. Unreal. unreal Dude, he is a savage, bro. Savage. And, and, and the thing with, with him, it's like, you can't you can't doubt what he's saying. He's worked with the absolute best in the world. Like I look up to Kobe and and uh, uh, and uh, Michael Jordan, like as if they're you know footballers. So it, it's amazing yeah. to to listen to that sort of mental resilience and it it's uh, yeah it's been an adaptation to a new country, uh, different norms, uh, driving on the other side of the road. Uh, changing gears <laughs> with my left hand. I mean, the accent that people ask Crazy, me today, uh, where are you from in the States? Uh, I say, I'm <laughs> from uh, Canada. I'm uh, from Toronto. Uh, they're like, but you speak Portuguese. I have to explain that. Oh, but you're born in Romania. I have to explain that. So I'm just like, 
you know, I'm this weird um, person in this society. I'm not yeah. kind of like the normal. Uh, but that's awesome, man. That's yeah, awesome. It's, it's, it's unique, good. man. Being different is so good, man. Yeah, it's been good, man. I mean, uh, it, there's there's a lot of challenges from a financial standpoint because you obviously convert your 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 even from American dollar. If you convert that into pounds, you just get ripped apart. Uh, yeah. but let alone a Canadian dollar. So I really felt that when I when I moved here, but uh, it made me hungrier and it makes me hungrier every day. Mm. And I kind of wanted to feel that a little bit. I felt myself getting soft and uh, getting kind of like Love a fat, fat cat, you know, like that sort of mm -hmm. um, complacency, you get complacent. You, you don't you don't approach everything with the same intent. And when you really, I mean, that this is what makes kind of those those David Goggins and and Neymar's and anybody that came from nothing so good, is that they have to make it. There's yes, no yes. there's no going back, bro. There's no going back to your four bedroom house uh, with your mom cooking and you know you have a car that you can drive and whatever. None of that, man. You have to make it. So I've kind of tried to create that that environment for myself now where I do feel that pressure and uh, hopefully try and tra transform myself a bit. Mm. You know, it's funny, man. I notice there's one culture, one continent that I really um, always see hunger in and the will to do anything. And you, you would probably see, say the same. And it's very, it's, it's very interesting, man. African players, man, they will yeah. do anything, anything, bro. And they're always happy. Always. How? You know what I mean? Always. Like, yeah. I respect them so much, man. Like, whenever you're around an African guy, African player, they're always happy. They're enjoying it. They, they're grateful for what they got, not for what they don't have. Yeah. What you said there is, and, and, and bro, they'll want to do anything, man. And um, that mindset is, is, like you talked from the beginning of the podcast, man, um, that mindset is that, and if we notice anything from Roka's story, mindset is everything. And I think it's incredible how um, you haven't, uh, you transitioned when you were younger and, and to where you are now, like the transition is, is unreal. Uh, and, and going back to that um, question, I always ask uh, guests is, you know, I know what age I would ask you, but if there's any age that you would go back to um, mm. what age would you go to and what would you tell yourself? What, what advice would you give uh, Serge at, at that age? Um, I would probably go back to like 15, like my, my first year in, uh, or, yeah, around that first year in, in Toronto C Academy, I would tell myself, to to be more well-rounded off the field so pay it. i would tell myself the way you do anything is the way you do everything yes. Yes. You know? so that's something that i've i've really learned recently and and it's so important so the way you know you put away your clothes the way you make your bed the way you keep your car the way you cut your yes. hair uh, wash yep. the dishes, tie your shoes, your presentation. It's the same yes. thing that you do in school, on the pitch, 100%. everything. Love that. So, Love that. Yeah, that's what I would tell myself, man. That's huge. Also, what I want to ask you, what would you tell yourself at, um, what was it, 18 when you had those opportunities in the third league uh, and, and you weren't going to get paid much. You were going to be in uncomfortable situations. What would you, with the knowledge you got now, what would you tell yourself at that age? Man, I would, I would say take anything. Take absolutely any opportunity and, and go work, learn from it. Put your ego aside. Put your pride aside. Just go and prove yourself. Um, and if you're quality, like you think you are, you know, you'll you'll quickly rise up the ranks if you're not mm -hmm. you'll you'll stay where you are or you might not even make the cut so it's just mm -hmm. about uh taking whatever is given to you because like you said those african players man 
Conte is an exa- an amazing example. He wakes up uh, in the morning, he goes for a run, goes to training, goes and trains like an animal, then has a match on Saturday, and he's the hardest worker on the pitch. So it's just if you can kind of embrace that mentality and just uh, take whatever is given to you and uh, grab it with both hands, then you'll go far in this game, I think. Mm. I got one more interesting question that I, that I had thought of. Um, all right, so if you, if you went back to yourself at 18 and you took the opportunity um, and you were playing at a high level, but you mm. didn't fix that mentality that you had, you were, you were the showboat guy. You had a little bit of ego, you know. Would you take that? Would you want no. that? Or would you want where you're at now? No, I'm happy with who I am, man. I'm I honestly that, happy dude. for my failures. Uh, I mean, failures. It's not like, called failure. Tim, Tim Grover talks about it. It's a failure when you give up. When you don't give up, it's a learning experience. So, um, no, I wouldn't pick that route because I would have still been the entitled uh, brat that has a professional contract that you see on Instagram every day flashing the Gucci bag or whatever. Uh, that's so, huge, you know, man. That's powerful. Learning. Yeah, Powerful. Bro. So, uh, yeah, we're about to end. Uh, give us one top tip for any young player looking to get to the next level, sign their first contract in, in 30 seconds. Let's see if you can get it. All right. Top tip for you guys, work your ass off, love the game, put your pride aside. Awesome, bro. Thanks so much for having you. We got to meet up sometime soon, drink some beers, yeah, man. train, enjoy. Uh, thanks for having me, Rick. Chat to